There, ladies and gentlemen, please may we rise as the faculty procession begins. The procession is being led by the flag bearer of the university. The faculty procession, the faculty procession will be followed by the principal officers of the Pan Atlantic University. As the faculty members take their seats, please let us remain standing while the principal officers process into the auditorium. Thank you. I now invite the Registrar of the Pan-Atlantic University, Mr. Kingsley Ukawaha, to the podium. The National Anthem, please.
You may be seated, please. The Vice Chancellor, the trustees of the Pan Atlantic University Foundation, members of the Governing Council, principal officers of the university, members of the University Management Council, members of the Pan Atlantic University Senate, deans of schools, directors of centers and units, faculty members, staff members, students, and alumni of Pan Atlantic University, our guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Professor Enase Okonedo, I welcome you to the 15th inaugural lecture of Pan Atlantic University. Inaugural lectures hold a special place in the academic tradition of universities all over the world. They formally commemorate the ascension of a faculty member to exalted rank of professor. Such august occasions give the university community and the public the opportunity to hear firsthand from the new professor about their contributions to knowledge. This is the reason we are here today. Professor Ogechi Adiola, Professor of Marketing, Lagos Business School, Pan Atlantic University, will shortly deliver the 15th inaugural lecture of the university titled Decolonizing Africa's Business Practices, Pro-Indigenous Pro Marketing Pathways to a Paradigm Shift. I would like to use this opportunity to introduce the persons on the stage. Dr. Ikechuku Obiaya is a Dean of the School of Media and Communication. <laughs> Professor Olainka David West, the Associate Dean of the Lagos Business School. <laughs> we have our inaugural lecturer, Professor Ogechi Adiola. Professor Enase Okonedo, the Vice Chancellor, Pan Atlantic University. And Dr. Dalintin Aholo, Dean, School of Science and Technology. As earlier announced, I am Kingsley Okoha, the Registrar of the University. I now invite the Vice Chancellor, Professor Enase Okonedo, to formally introduce the lecturer. Please welcome Professor Kennedy with a round of applause. Ogechi Adiola is a professor of marketing and the head of the Department of Operations, Marketing and Information Systems at Lagos Business School, Pan Atlantic University, Nigeria. Ogechi holds a doctorate in business administration and a master of business administration from Manchester Business School, United Kingdom. She also earned a Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of Nigeria and obtained a Barrister at Law certificate from the Nigerian Law School, after which she was called to the Nigerian Bar. She serves as an independent non-executive director of Cornerstone Insurance PLC in Nigeria a member of the governing board of the University of Kigali, Rwanda, and a business administration advisory board member of the University of the People, California, United States of America. Before her academic career, she spent over a decade in various roles within Nigeria's financial sector, notably starting her journey at Citibank, Nigeria. Adiola's research interests encompass marketing, strategy, tourism, and gender studies, with a particular focus on projecting a positive image for Africa. Her scholarly works include over 100 academic and practitioner articles, books, conference papers, and business and marketing case studies. Her academic papers have been published in top peer review journals, such as the Journal of International Business Studies, Annals of Tourism Research, Tourism Management, Journal of Business Research, Industrial Marketing Management, Psychology and Marketing, 
an international marketing review. Our co-authored papers have also won Best Paper Awards at international conferences in the years 2016 to 2019 consecutively, and the prestigious Emerald Literati Award for Outstanding Paper in 2022. Additionally, our co-authored contributions have been published in esteemed higher-ranking academic journals, including those with prestigious ABS 3, 4, and Foster rankings, assigned by the Chartered Association of Business Schools, ABS. Professor Adiola's work has garnered both international and national acclaim, earning her rankings as one of the top scientists in her field in Nigeria and Africa. She ranked the number two scientist in Nigeria for marketing, the number six scientist in Nigeria for business and management, and among the top 10 scientists in Africa for marketing. This is according to the Global January 2023 Alpha Doga Scientific Index. Elsevier ranked her among the top 100 scholars in Nigeria across all disciplines during the period 2020 to 2023. Apart from her research achievements, Adiola has excelled in teaching and mentoring students. She has taught marketing sessions at the Women Entrepreneurship and Leadership for Africa program of the China Europe International Business School held in Lagos, the MSc program at the University of Ghana Business School, and the PhD program at the University of Professional Studies, Accra, Ghana. She is also an MBA program external moderator at the University of Free State Business School, South Africa, and a PhD program external examiner at Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Gordon Institute of Business Science, University of Pretoria, South Africa, and Strathmore University, Kenya. She is a 2016 Visiting International Fellow at the Open University Business School, Milton Keynes, United Kingdom, and a 2017 Paul R. Lawrence Fellow, USA. Ogechi has provided strategic marketing and brand management consultancy, intra-regional advisory, and gender equity services to numerous organizations. She is part of the Alpha team at the Center for Global Enterprise USA and has provided virtual consultancy services to top international companies, including London Taxi Company UK in 2015, the Texas Capital Bank USA in 2018, and Dusit International, Dusit Thani, Thailand in 2021. Ogechi is also a consultant for Afro-Exim Bank, focusing on the African Sub-Sovereign Government's Network Initiative. With a keen interest in women's empowerment, Ogechi served in 2022 as a national consultant for an international labor organization project aimed at promoting women's economic empowerment in Nigeria. In March 2022, she received the prestigious Female Achievers Recognition Award acknowledging her significant contribution to women's empowerment, hosted by American Corner and other esteemed organizations in Lagos. In June 2023, she was honored by the Peak Performer with the Peak Performing Women of the Year 2023, 2023 Award in the Super Achievers category for Executive Education. Ogechi is a Fellow of the Institute of Strategic Management Nigeria and the National Institute of Marketing of Nigeria. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Professor Ogechi Adiola. Thank you. Good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. My welcome you to the Lagos Business School, Pan-Atlantic University. Thank you. I'll wait for my slides. Thank you. Prelude. I want to take you down memory lane to the year 2000. For those that can remember, what's your, what can you remember about the year? 
we are at the precipice of a new millennium. And it was 1990, you think about 1999 and going to 2000. For some of us that are bankers, it was a y, that Y2K millennium bug, and then we thought everything would crash, that the computers would crash, that the banks would fail, food supply, some, we just thought everything would crash, till Australia turned into the new millennium and nothing happened, and we heaved a sigh of relief. Some of you will remember the Sydney 2000 Olympic festivities and the wins, the draws, and everything about it. For some, it's the tragic floods in Mozambique that occurred between February and March that year. For others that are in the IT, in the tech industry, they'll remember the dot-com bubble peak and the subsequent crash. I remember all this. But there's something else that has been engraved deep in my hippocampus. It was the cover story of the Economist magazine, precisely May 13, 2000. And there, the economist, it was entitled The Hopeless Continent and Hopeless Africa. It ignited a spark in me because it, it wasn't the Africa of my dream, the Africa where I wait for the cock to crow at dawn and the morning sky to rise deep early and Mother Africa to wrap me in her warm embrace is not the Africa I wrote about and dreamt of since childhood. That was not my Africa. And I want to ask you, which Africa do you dream of? Which Africa comes to your mind when you think of the continent of Africa? Is it the Africa on the left side of the screen or the right? Is it the Africa that you see all those negative qualities? Or is it the Africa that is the land of hope? I will show you the Africa I dream of. The Vice Chancellor the registrar, other principal officers of the Pan-Atlantic University, the dean, Lagos Business School, other deans and directors, heads of departments, members of the Senate and congregation, my lords, spiritual and temporal, members and friends of the university, fellow academic and professional colleagues, special guests and family members, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm deeply honored to present the present subject, Decolonizing Africa's Business Practices, Pro-Indigenous Marketing Pathways that will lead to a paradigm shift. This is the way today's presentation will go. Introduction first, roots and foundation, more of my background insights and discovery, research interests, research findings, vision and proposition for Africa, conclusion, then a charge and appreciation. Introduction. An African proverb wisely states, a river that forgets its source will dry up, highlighting the importance of history in nurturing the present and shaping the future. This resonates deeply with my life as my past experiences have shaped my present reality, family, career trajectory, adding vibrant hues to my journey. As an Igbo woman married to a Yoruba man, my name embodies the beauty of Nigeria's diverse cultural tapestry, providing me with a unique perspective on multiculturalism 
proudly identifying as an African business scholar and a Pan-Africanist. My passion lies in studying Africa's rich multicultural and multi-ethnic history, culture, politics, and languages, particularly exploring how Africa's unique social and economic values can be effectively marketed to the world. It is on this foundation, ladies and gentlemen, that I built this inaugural topic. Africa possesses distinct cultural and business values that have, unfortunately, been overshadowed by widespread acceptance and emphasis on Western approaches, which, in my view, have not yielded the desired outcome. As an African scholar, I draw upon post-colonialism, decolonization, and cultural studies theories that align with Africans' reality while challenging the stereotypical and essentialist views of the continent and its people. My academic approach lies at the intersection of marketing and entrepreneurship, delving into the diverse cultural differences within and between African countries, particularly their unique traditional business practices. Through my exploration of various business issues, I have uncovered Africans' cultural embedded trade, sales, marketing, and entrepreneurial practices that hold immense potential to accelerate our continent's development. Researching these distinct practices have provided me with profound insights into the dynamic nature of the continent's business environment and its global potential. Indeed, knowledge is best well shared, when shared. In this inaugural lecture, I will share my journey of studying Africa's dynamic business environment and my favor to market Africa to the world, drawing from a wealth of independent and collaborative research findings, field experiences, historical antecedent, contemporary reality, I will present a symphony of pro-indigenous marketing pathways aimed at decolonizing Africa's business practices. This would be my primary research focus and post-professoral agenda going forward. My hope is that by sharing this knowledge, others will be inspired to recognize and leverage the true value of indigenous capital bringing us one step closer to the Africa of our dreams. I would now take you through my roots and foundation so you would understand why I am very passionate about the country, the continent. This is me. My father would recognize me and my mama. <laughs> so this is me. I. I grew up in Enugu, and when I was eight years old, I wrote a book, a, a novel, called, titled, entitled, titled Saving Her, and I gave it to my father. He gave it to his secretary that typed it on a Smith Corona, Smith, Cor Smith Corona typewriter, those, that, those ones that you use and you tipex. Last week, last some months ago, I went to Enugu and I saw it, and it was so emotional for me. I just saw his handwriting and where it had been tipped. My mother will take all of us, we are eight. Um, I have seven siblings. He'll take us to Junior Opinion, Tortis Club, and she was so passionate about it. And this is my mother. Those of us in Federal where you recognize this. And they are wearing, they, are, they have blue scarf, yes. You recognize this uh, uh, check, <laughs> check out blue uniform. Thank you, Mama. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mama. So from Federal Wherry, I it, it built me up. I was, um, I, we had this school principal, Mrs. Gigi Garrick. She would tell us, don't go cap in hand begging get your meal ticket. And it was every Monday morning assembly. And I wonder, you know, I don't want to go cap in hand begging. I didn't want to get my meal ticket. I knew I had to work hard. And she kept on, it was just the usual refrain telling us that we should work hard. And, not the, and that was, that shaped me. Then, Mr. Abelson, our music teacher. How many of you remember him? 
<laughs> and he, would come, he taught us that we can have fun. And he loved um, the man with the golden gun. And I think he's Roger Moore. And he would say, my son would not want me to sing, but he would, he would just come and he would tell us we'll be dancing. James Brown was coming down the chimney pie. He met a man with a golden gun. Shot him once. <laughs> And then we'll all be dancing. It made me know that I can, we can have fun, even as we are working hard. I was, uh, I'm known as the school poet. I, could, I was always writing. And a memory when the Minister of Education came to our school, I told our principal that I wanted to recite, and it was way against indiscipline. And I stood there, and I started. I for ingratitude, in my little voice, N for negligence. D for dishonesty, I for inhumanity, S for sadism, C for corruption, I for indolence, P for prejudice, L for lying, I for inefficiency, N for noise making, E for excesses. Then I'll scratch. Cries, cries here and there, hunger, hunger everywhere. Oh, Nigeria, where is the way? I was always crying for Nigeria. Then I, I'll just say, I'll just continue. But that wasn't the only cry in my heart. I will cry for Mandela. I'll imagine him in Robin Island. And in my little bunk, I will be crying. And I'll be writing, free Mandela, as they are crying. I, would, I saw this, and it's dated, <laughs> you can see the date, 1987, down in the south of Africa. I'd never been to South Africa then. Lies the land you can reach, where green grass grows. I believe it grows there. And, crops. and I would always write and cry for Africa. I was just that passionate about Africa. I saw hope in Africa. And I continued when I finished secondary school. My mama said I asked a lot of questions. I said I must go to law school. I must read law. And I obeyed. I actually thought I would do, I'll read mass communication, but I obeyed my mama. And I'm glad I did. <laughs> and from law school, I was called to the bar. Then I went to NCC briefly, Nigerian Communications Commission, then Citibank. And in Citibank, my bosses felt I was in legal. I started operations then in legal. My bosses felt I'll be better in private banking. And that was how I didn't believe it at that time. I wasn't happy at that time, but it's the best decision benefit of hindsight. And I moved to private banking, and that's how my marketing career took off. As I was working in bank, I was still writing. I will write children's books, Joe and Skipper, The Bush Rat, House Rat, Miss Wiki, Wiggy, they, that wear different wigs, a personification of me, then Maki, the Mohawk, and I will write. I moved over to writing for Guardian newspaper, and I, for over two years or three years, I would run a Saturday column about life, love, politics. <laughs> I was just so passionate. At a time, I was also passionate about the country. I said no. I wrote that uh, about, I responded in the back, on the back page of this day, newspaper that IBB should not run. It was a response, and I categorized the woes and everything happening and how my generation has not been given a chance. And I was pleading for a chance for us, for the younger generation. So this is me, nicknamed Colors by my students. They call me Professor Colors. I heard it from some of them. <laughs> Testament. I've got, I, I won't say much about it. So and my life has just been God's grace and guidance, and thank you for all of you that have helped shape my life in one way or the other. Thank you. I'll go to my insights and discovery. So my driving force, once I had the pen, and I was in, in academia, I... I decided to write. I wanted to emphasize the beauty and potential of Africa. And I was so passionate. I said, I'm an African writer in Africa, writing for Africa. I wanted to write for Africa. So that has been my, my, my goal. And to counter, I know Africa has problems. I'm not going to sugarcoat. But I also know that we have potential. 
So I, I look at this, and so we had Time Magazine, Africa's Troubles, 1984, Agony of Africa, Time Magazine, and you see this little child, and you see this hopeless uh, that I had mentioned with the guy encaged in the map of Africa, and he had a missile-like rifle on his shoulder, and then AIDS in Africa. But you know, there was hope. Because in 2011, I was happy to see another narration of Africa. And this is Africa. Africa rising. There's a little guy, a young guy with a rainbow running in what looks like savannah. And there's an acacia tree. And he had the rainbow in the map of Africa. And I could see the sun. And I can see everything. It's really, it's made me happy. And they said after decades of small, slow growth, Africa has a real chance to follow in the footsteps of Asia. Africa's progress is a reminder of the transformative promise of growth. And that, that's good. That was December 2011. Then the narrative is changing, and I'm happy. So from hopeless continent, we have Africa rising, Time Magazine, Africa rising, aspiring Africa. Now there's a new scramble for Africa. The Chinese are here. I'm not going to say much. We are now. So, again, so the question to me is how do you market Africa? How do you market Africa? For me, my goal is to reclaim Africa's narrative, spotlighting Africa, not only for me, but for the younger generation that are Jaffa, that are leaving the country. I want them, even if they leave, I want them to come to find a way to contribute to the development of Africa. So as a marketing teacher, I understand the power of storytelling in changing narratives. The Latin maxim says, rest if so loquito. <laughs> let the past speak for itself. So it says, until the lion learns to write, every story will glorify the hunter's So I'm part of an, an, the army of academics advocating for a vibrant Africa. In here, there's a VC, there's a pro-VC, there's a dean. They are just all over the Africa. And there's a, 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 an associate prof. So we, they are all my friends. So I'm part of an army, and there are many of us advocating for a vibrant Africa, a goal I have pursued since my academic writing took, took up. So I see hope. I see hidden gems. I see a hopeful Africa. But the question is, how can this army collaborate to market Africa as a continent? What are the dynamics of the operating environment in Africa? And what distinctive values and practices can promote social and political development? Those are very key questions. So let me take you to my research philosophy. My research philosophy is grounded in positivism following the traditions and orientations of French philosopher Auguste Comte, who is considered the progenitor of positivist research. And what does it mean? Is at the core is harnessing scientific method and empirical observation. So we decode natural and social realms, and we strive for, importantly, we strive for rigor, and we strive for objectivity. And we utilize structured inter questionnaire statistical analysis techniques. We examine relationship between variables, and we aim to generate empirical evidence. So I focus on Africa, as I said. I look at cultural attributes within Africa. I, we also employ with my co-authors theories, different theories, and any um, Western theories and any pertinent African theory. We don't have many uh, models, sorry. Then research method. My research method is actually a combination of quantitative and qualitative. Um, sometimes I use more, I use quanti quantitative, but when it's necessary, I use qualitative methods depending on the, but, uh, on the context, but the importance is objectivity and rigor. Now my research journey. Because I focus on Africa, everything Africa, customer service management in Africa, sales marketing in Africa, marketing, health service marketing in Africa, public sector marketing in Africa, green marketing, emerging market, okay, then 
we have marketing communication, um, new public, then business to business marketing. We found out that there's no business to business marketing, the B2B marketing in Africa. So three, four of us gathered together and we all co-authored the book. We looked at the business landscape and um, it's one of the books that I, I really, I enjoyed all my books, but it was one that I, I was actually very glad that we have something to offer um, that is not, that is very unique. Um, we also go into digital business in Africa. We went into digital, researched on digital business in Africa. This is an edited book. Then digital service delivery in Africa. But Africa. But then again, I'm very passionate about gender. So during COVID, I started projecting women and its gender perspective on COVID-19 recovery and empowering African women towards sustainable development. But increasingly, I have focused on marketing and looking at business practices within Africa. And I edited this book, Indigenous African Enterprise, the Igbo Traditional Business School, ITBS. And later, Igbo Boy looked at the Igbo system with Valentine Ozibo. Uh, and thereafter, I went into promoting business books in Africa. I want to, you to take a look at this young chap, young boy. Imagine him in a state or in the countryside. He would have been hopeless but if nobody took him up. So you can imagine the Igbo practice, which is called Igbo boy. It's an apprenticeship system where they pick up the young people and train them. This system has incubated many young Nigerians from Southeast Nigeria. If this boy is left on his own, he would not be this. I'm just picture this. Very productive to the society, and we talk about creating jobs. So that is what the Igbo system is about. And when I looked into it, I got, there are some of us here that contributed, the indigenous African um, enterprise, the Igbo traditional business school. We found that it's a school without a wall. But it has this long, age-long practice that has incubated many businesses. And this is informal, but it's very, it's very structured. More structures than, structured than you can imagine. So this is it. The structure has talent recruitment. It also has the apprenticeship model. And in the apprenticeship model, there are different types in the Igbo system. So there's Igbo boy to serve another, I, which is also Igbo Dibo. Igbo here to learn markets. <laughs> then Igbo to learn a trade. Then there's another one you see when you go to the markets. Igbo also up here. Some of you might call it Igbo's are here. <laughs> the market around runners, they are trained. And in that, they, it's locally generated venture capital because they, they kind of train you. It's based on a philosophy which should be looked at. It's called the one nay philosophy. And it's premised on Onyagara one nay. Do not leave your brethren behind. <laughs> As you are moving up, do not forget your kindred they have their financial practices and they rotate and they have deferred um, financial arrangements where they can get goods from their sellers. There's also sales negotiation, which um, Dr. Uchiato also looked at in the Igbo book, he's here. It's they, they, it's, they aim for a win-win situation, so they kind of demystify the complexity, they teach them how to do it. There's conflict management, I think Dr. Silk is here. He looked at it. Reconciliation. So it's systemized. It's a systematic way of doing business. There's also the family business. So the business ownership routes are in Igbo land. Apprenticeship, Igbo boy. Then there's business by family business, inheritance, where you have all the, young, the Igbo businesses um, that we have. Young shall grow and the rest of them. And then the entrepreneurial incubation, which is very, the one you see in Alaba market. It's, it has, they, they have their own clusters, shoemaking cluster, the transport cost cluster, 
pharmaceutical cluster. They are very, very, very well organized. So when I was researching, I asked one of them, and I know he might be here. I call him Oga Moses. He's an Oga. Is Oga Moses here? Oga Moses, thank you. <laughs> I said, thank you, Oga Moses. Oga Moses is in the cluster of motor spare parts. And I asked him, <laughs> I asked him, Oga Moses, how, where you get these boys? How do you know? How do you make sure that they are with you and they don't cheat you? He said that when they, do, when they go to the family and they, do, they have the sort of introduction, the talent recruitment, that they, you know, spiritual, the power of prayer, they pray, what prayer? What you do to me, another person will do. <laughs> and that's, I said, that's data, right? They say yes. And, and at the end of it, they call it free, um, you have to have your settlement. So your God will settle you, with also bless you. And not only initially they used to settle with money, but now they settle with goods. They can give you a shop to manage. They introduce you to their, they give you their trade secret. And that way, businesses are replicated. So that's it. I want us to take a listen. Robert Newitz, in the 2017 TED Talk, said the Igbo apprenticeship system that governs Alabama international market is the largest business incubator platform in the world. I said, okay, why don't I look at Africa? What do we have in this Africa I love? So I edited these two books, Indigenous Business Practices in Africa, Indigenous Business 2, Volume 1 and Volume 2. And I found out that you can be categorized into the indigenous businesses, into like six. So you have apprenticeship, you have um, the creative industry, you have trade, you have production, you have the um, you have the financial sector, and you have other tradings. So let's see what I found out. What I found out is that the, the apprenticeship system exists in Ghana and Benin Republic. So people, um, my co-author, other, the authors that um, came together with me to, to, make, to, for, to, um, to write, to work on the project, um, some did Ghana, some Benin Republic. So it was interesting, similar. So there are similarities across Africa. Healthcare, we have many indigenous practices. In some authors from um, Nigeria, South Africa, Zimbabwe, they just have all this medical medicine, local medicine that nobody is marketing. Nobody is, they are not scared, they are just in their silos. Some will tell you how they cured so many ailments, but we need, it's just in, um, it's not institutionalized. Again, we had trade-related, agri-business, agri and some other um, informal markets where the authors came, we investigated Ghana, Uganda, Tanzania. I was so happy to get somebody from Democratic Republic of Congo. I know he might be listening. Thank you. Kenya and Ghana. Production. Many across Africa, we have local production. And we found in Zambia, um, Rwanda, and Nigeria. Finance, this is so common. We have the Isusu in Igbo land, Isusu in Yoruba land, and deep other aspects. In, in the, in the north, northern Nigeria, we have different, called different names, but it's the same principle. It's the same principle of savings. One is rotating savings and credit, and the other one is the ask as the susu, and the other one is the local person that goes around to collect. These practices, Kenya, South Africa, South Africa has a, an interesting one called Stockville, and Sierra Leone, Nigeria, in the book. Cultural and creative. Egypt. I was happy to have authors from Egypt, and that was good. And we looked, because we, we looked at they, the authors considered the local fabric, the local um, industries there. We had Ghana, we had the Kente. Um, the movie and music is coming in book three. So we, this is what we have. And we had people from Ethiopia too. Ethiopia had an interesting contribution. 
I want us to look at one of the cases from Egypt and what they did what, uh, with local industries and trying to modernize the, um, the fabric industry and the outcome. Take a listen. To a traditional technique. Basically, a kadim is a flat woven rug that's made by weaving on a, on a horizontal loom. Um, and it's been a craft that's been around for centuries in Egypt. All of our craftsmen learned the craft from their fathers, their grandfathers, and now we don't have any younger craftsmen to work um, because they stopped passing it on to younger generations. We started off in Fowa, it's a village in Kafr Sheikh. Fowa used to be the hub of kadim weaving in Egypt. About Two decades ago, there were over 2,000 workshops in Poa, um, but today there are less than 200. So our initiative aims to revive it so that craftsmen can continue working in the industry uh, and find it a sustainable means for income, as well as retaining our cultural heritage of the craft itself. Clean fabric and how they revived it and what they did. So, how can we dec um, decolonize Africa and um, business practices in Africa. What, but let's, let me take you through what decolonization is. Decolonization is a nation systematic and intentional process of creating independent framework detached from colonial orientation. It started in 18, well, it started earlier, but there was a the Berlin, conference, Berlin Conference of 1884 was where Africa was divided up. So the British took, all, took Nigeria, there are different other places and that um, divided Africa according to interest. And this is what happened. And this is a picture of the conference. I think this the one in the middle is Ottman von Bismarck yeah. and the first chancellor of Germany. So this is what happened, and um, Nigeria later became, in uh, 1914, we know what happened, and, and that was when the North and, um, the North and South Protectorate came together. Okay. So I would go to um, looking at it and saying to ourselves, what happened before the colonization of Africa? Africa boasted of advanced civilization with unique commerce models. We had the Great Pyramid of Giza, Egypt. We had empires of Timbuktu, Songhai, and Mali. And those were the pre-colonial African empires. They don't teach, I'm not sure if this is still taught in history. We had Saka, I used to call, we used to call them Saka the Zulu, but it's Saka Zulu, Zulu land, South Africa, Queen Amina of Zaria, Jaja of Opobo, and Mansa Musa. If you Google the richest man that's ever been in, existed, you won't see Elon Musk. I even saw somebody asking, is, Saka, is Mansa Musa richer than on the internet? And he said, yes, he was very, very rich. We had African legends. My premise is not that Western models are bad or there's something inherently wrong. My premise is that, are they ta is it tailored to meet our needs? That's the question we'll ask. And what happened to Africa? So they, again, the world's oldest universities before Oxford, UK, you will find the university in Tunisia. You find Sankore Mosque and University in Mali, 989 and others. There are core issues we should consider. Why, what's going on? What, what happened? Again, there are many ways, um, what, uh, many, um, why there's predominance of Western models and management theories. Even when I came into academia, I found that, that that's all we are using. We are, not, we, we are not using it in conjunction with African models. We are using it, we are 
focused more on the Western model without thinking, is it what we need? Is it custom, is, is it customized or can it be customized for Africa? So there are so many reasons. Again, we had more of the colonial influence and cultural assumption of inferiority of um, our models, our practices, and then again, media influence has a lot of impact. But I want to say that there are not, Western approaches are not tailored to African business model um, landscape. If you take it on its own, it's not. Why? Be let's look at this quote. I mean, marketing, more than a, mil a billion consumers, 60% of living in rural area, 2,100 languages. In Nigeria, we have over 250 languages, 54 countries. These facts only begin to capture African size and diversity. There are cultural differences, different business operating environment, and again, the inherent challenges that we know in Africa. Contrasting development stages, we are different. It's different. They are advanced, and we are called developing. The difference in demographics, now we have millennials more, and we have a young, Africa is boasting of young, more younger, younger generation now. Complex mix of trade channels. We have different open markets in Angola, cantinas, more prominent, they are street vendors. How do you manage the informalities? Large informal markets, we know that, very large informal sector, and again, we have differences in cultural orientation, individualism and communalism. But if we say, many of us have looked at this and said, let's adopt African model, but it's also challenging. Very, very challenging. Because of the diversity challenge, 2,100 languages, different cultures, 54 countries, a large informal sector. Documentation challenge, people are not keeping, we're not keeping documents about pre-colonial, even post-colonial documentation challenge. Perception challenge from us on inferiority. Financial constraint, nobody is funding. All my research on African business, Iwo business, nobody, is you don't get people to fund it. And infrastructure and resources, we don't have centers. It's, we have just few centers for African studies. And again, they are not foc many of them are not focusing on the indigenous businesses. Now, the question is, looking inwards, how ca can African organizations be encouraged to explore indigenous models? And this author, Ngungi Wan Tiongo, he said, the richness of Africans' indigenous knowledge is an untapped resource that can pave way for holistic development. So, where, what are these practices or models? Looking within Africa, there are three major ones that you can at least look at to the best of my knowledge. There's the Ubuntu from South Africa, which is rooted in I am because you are. And it's derived from South African is Zulu language. A person is a person because of or through others. And it has all the spirituality, um, benevolence, collectivism, humanism, and reciprocity. All that, looking at Africa, for them, that's the core. What is the essence? What's the human? I pro, I'm making progress because you're making progress. And their spirituality, we believe so much in the more of spirituality. We, we focus a lot. So we cannot divorce that from our reality in Africa. And collectivism, communal focus. How can we lead to the betterment of the society as against the individualism? Um, Nelson Mandela, that I used to cry about, said, in Africa, there's a concept known as Ubuntu, the profound sense that we are human only through the humanity of others, that if we are to accomplish anything in this world, it would be in equal measure, it will in equal measure be due to the work and achievements of others. The Igbo boy, I've mentioned it, the Igbo system 
of apprentice, the Igbo apprenticeship system, so I'm not going to go into it. The last one is African capitalism. And I want to read a quote from Tony Elumelu. The answer to Africans' development challenges is in the hands of Africa, not Americans, Europeans, or Chinese. The answer will not come from development bank initiative or incentives or relief programs. And the goodwill of others, however well-intentioned, will never be enough to empower our industry. What we need are more capitalists with a passion for Africa. What we need are African capitalists. And what is African capitalism? Is the involvement of it focuses on the involvement of African private sector in fostering development by creating not only economic but social values and they in investing in sectors like agriculture, healthcare, power. African capitalism is, I believe, African capitalism should be projected and promoted more. It was coined by Tony Elumelu in 2011. I'll take you to my part four, visions and proposition. So what's the way forward? We've looked at these African philosophies and models, but what they underscore is the importance of communal value, long-term sustainable growth, and the need for indigenous solutions to local challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to an Africa-centric model that I have developed, which businesses, entrepreneurs, Government scholars can embrace to incorporate unique indigenous business practices from Africa. Presenting the Afri indigenous integrative business model. And this is it. Capturing everything from my research that I believe and, and I know that an African model should look like. I will start with the first. Indigenous knowledge and practices. Look, emphasizing utilization of local traditions, resources, financial models. How can we promote some of these practices? Can we digitize a susu, which some people are doing? Can we look at practices that have bearing, that work? I started a fish farm one day. Well, we started a fish farm one day in the house. <laughs> Before I get to over, they say I... I I said I've got a fish farm, great, <laughs> because they are <all> here, <laughs> even the owner. <laughs> yes. So we started a fish farm, and the fishes were dying. <laughs> and we're wondering, so we call, there's a community you have of the fish farmers. If your fishes are dying, what happened? They just told us, add, just get a leaf. And it was a leaf we had in our garden. I don't want to mention the name. But immediately, the fishes revived. And in the seminar I went for, I went to, somebody said, Soldier ants are killing my pigs because it was an agri seminar. And somebody said, put, well, around it, engine oil or something. And, they, you know, there were some solutions. But we, they are not codified. They are not codified. They are just in silos. What can we do? Again, can we look at the apprenticeship model and also entrepreneurial education? Can we incorporate it? Hands on learning, mentorship take people on, and we can even do it, involve, include it in our human capital development um, management. How can we look at it and somebody will mentor and the person will mentor another person? So it's going to be revolving, locally generated <laughs> mentorship. Okay, contextual relevance, everything we are doing, and if we're going to look at an indigenous man, um, model, it must recognize Africans' unique social um, social cultural and economic and historical environment. Let's go back to our history too. Again, community is very important. Values, community engagement, and shared benefit, promoting collaboration and mutual prosperity. Oga Moses was always emphasizing we have this association. Every country, I did the, when I, I did the ILO um, consulting, I found out that small businesses, they all have their informal, every, no, even if you call it hairdresser, they have their bigger platform. And they told me, one of them told me that governments would always say they are helping them. But if they don't come through their, their association, they don't reach them. 
how do we keep records? Empowerment and inclusivity. We encourage participation, we'll encourage participation of both genders, ensuring equal opportunities. I know there are some places in Africa that, of course, they, this is not applicable, but how do we encourage participation of both genders? Resilience and adaptability. Indigenous businesses are resilient in navigating complex environments. Some farmers I spoke to, they told me how they are able to get crop resistant crop, um, species and what they do. Some of them involve a bit of, a, a, a bit of looking at shifting cultivation, but in a different way. But looking at it, there are so many practices, the, the way they, they are able to survive. And cultural preservation, support the preservation of African culture and contributing to um, business differentiation. Nollywood is doing a good job. Gollywood and some other across Africa, we have that. Ethical business values. Let's look within Africa too, in addition to what we have from the Western, are there values that we should also incorporate? African capitalism orientation which balances economic goals with social development. Can we think of, in places where we can, can we look at a kind of blend between Western and, and African, where applicable? We will look at it and say, what can work? And again, let's think of it in terms of social development. Ubuntu, there's no African business management that I believe that should be mentioned without mentioning Ubuntu. It endorses a management style rooted in core African values like communalism, humanism, people-centered practices, respect, and spirituality. So, now to introduce, to look at, we have this concept and this model. What are the marketing pathways that will lead to a paradigm shift? The Afro-Indigenous integrative business model requires strong building blocks. There must be marketing pathways that will catalyze uh, its transformation. I mean, let me introduce the PIMS to you. And I call the PIMS Pro Indigenous Marketing Pathways, which identifies three action oriented propositions that will serve as pathways that will propel social and economic success. What do we need to do? PIMS, positive projection active adoption, policy, and market support. Positive projection of what is Africa, of the positive things or positive attributes of Africa. Active adoption, policy, and market support. In positive projection, can we promote brand Africa through research, publication, and cultural showcases? Can we counter negative perceptions, showcase African potential in tourism, business, and investment? I want the researchers here, what can we do? Think of Africans' unique selling proposition. Can we emphasize storytelling, more of case studies on Africa, which I know the Lagos Business School is doing already? Let's do branding and visibility. What, let's, let's ensure that differentiates African, what is unique about African enterprises? And language, I know it's, I wondered about it. Is there a way we can promote major African languages? Again, let's boost tourism and investment opportunities. Rwanda has been, Rwanda has been doing that, projecting Africa. Take a listen. This is Rwanda. Bonjour. Rwanda. Ouais. Kigali. Le 
premier gorille que nous baptisons descend de la famille Zimbi. Le deuxième bébé gorille que nous baptisons descend de la famille Mouosa. How can we promote Africa through tourism? Think outside the box, throw the box away. What should we do? The next one is active adoption. I want businesses to infuse local tradition and practices that are viable into business operations. In the book, in case book, there were so many traditions that we could we found across Africa that businesses could adopt. How can we leverage local resources for maximum benefits? Can we incorporate unique African models into our operations? Can we look at local methods and approaches and see which ones can be scaled? Can we emphasize, we see some that are not where they should be and not that have not been developed. Can we look at how, can we emphasize environmentally responsible practices and say, okay, even as the world is going to ESG and going into some other sustainability practices, how can we help our local indigenous businesses, our indigenous practices, how can we help improve, improve indigenous practices? Let's also consider indigenous concepts and practices in marketing. And we should share success stories, have more case studies of African country, companies that are doing great things. I want to show you a company that used to lies that looked at the indigenous practice and they were able to have more top of mind awareness and I believe share of the wallet. Let's take a listen. Hero, I SAB came to Mina. this city on a night bus many years ago. Where he took me under his wings and taught me the ropes. Then he cleared a fresh path for me and started me on my journey. Now, passing on this legacy to my son. A legacy that will outlive me. But this is the sum of our efforts. This is the true reward for us. I have given. May your name never be forgotten. Do never ever leave your brethren behind. Thank you. So that is hero. Policy and market support. Importance of government policies to uplift indigenous businesses. There must be deliberate efforts. They must advocate for standards, have governance, and put in place sustainable practices. I believe that governments in Africa should have pro-indigenous policies. They should implement. I also believe that they should encourage long-term growth and upscaling. They should look at all those associations that are in silos across Africa. What can they do? They should, they should promote market growth and regional integration. We should trade. I know African continental free trade area is doing a lot in that aspect, but more needs to be done. There should be standards especially in the healthcare, what, can we, what do we do? What should government do about the herbal practices? How can they help? How can we have breakthroughs from Africa? Engagement, we need collaboration. Again, I believe government should set up agencies that will fund research. They should shield and they should amplify indigenous knowledge. I believe in government involvement. When government is involved, a lot would happen will make more progress. Let's go to Ghana and the year of 2019, the year of return, where the government was, they were encouraging African Americans to come back and see the potential in Ghana. Take it. In America, 
African in England. Don't forget where you are from. Canada to Suriname. Thank you for my motherland. Don't forget your mother tongue. Please don't shoot me, we are one. Refuse, refuse. Refuse, na ye kew. 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 America, uh, African in England, don't forget where you are from, Canada to Suriname, thank you for my motherland, don't forget your mother tongue, please don't shoot me, we are one. Refuse, 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 na ye Wrapping up now. I said with the narrative and mischaracterization of Africa, impoverished and war torn is improving now. There is need in, for a shift in perspective and per perception towards a nuanced understanding of Africa. We need to promote positive cultural expressions and other industries. We need to look at movie. We are doing a lot in music, you must agree, and movies. But what of businesses? Role of researchers. You, researchers here across Africa, you need to promote African value through academic publication. It's, we're not perfect, but there are things when you look and say what can be improved, because that's what research is about. We need to address publication disparity between developed and developing nations. We know about it. They publish more, especially in um, top journals, and they, are more, they get more accepted. What do we do? I presented the Afro-Indigenous an integrative model as a tool for promoting indigenous practices and the three building blocks, PIMS, for transformation. My appeal is for stakeholder collaboration. Let's collaborate for the decolonization of business practices and promotion of African businesses. And let's, the, let's appeal to our governments, wherever they are, to establish agencies to protect and project indigenous businesses. And I have a charge for everybody. We started with year 2000. How many years is it now, thereafter? What has changed? We are now, going to, we are now in 2023. I want to ask, before, for everybody, before adopting a Western solution, can we look inwards? Are there some? Can we have a hybrid? Are there some, again, we should? amplify, what should we do? And I want everybody to make it, decide to do one of these things. You're a scholar, reshape, I want you to choose one. Can you tell your story? Reshape the narrative of Africa, one story at a time, start with yours. You are an academic, can you commit to reading or writing one Africa-centric research paper? or book this month. You're in the audience. Can you reconnect with your roots? Can you attend a local cultural event, support African artists, or simply learn more about our diverse traditions? Can you empower the women around you, recognize their potential, I had to put that in, and give them the platform they deserve? Remember the apprenticeship system. Can you mentor, guide, or support at least one young person or an individual in your community? You're, you, you're, you're outside Africa. Can you start a conversation about the real Africa with your colleagues, your friends, your family? And for everybody, can you reflect on today's insight and ask, how can you better align with Africa's unique strengths and challenges? Don't forget the challenges. I believe an Africa, Afro-Indigenous model is possible. I believe we can promote that. 
I believe we can recognize the beauty in our heritage. I believe it's possible, and I believe it's within reach. Let's do it, Africa. Thank you. Appreciation. I have a long list and somehow I'm wondering whether to read out, but I appreciate everybody here. Everybody that has stepped out, those online watching. I'll just go through and see how I can, what I can. Appreciation. To the God, to God Almighty, our Father in heaven, thank you for showering me with your love, your strength, your grace, guidance throughout my life. I am grateful. To my father, Chief Emmanuel Eza Ngomno. Thank you for your belief, your love. Thank you for always calling me Ngoge. Thank you, Daddy. To Mama, we call her Kwanis. She's, <laughs> thank you for everything. Thank you for sharing your love upon us. Thank you for all you have done. And you know I'm really grateful. From the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you and Daddy for everything. <laughs> to my husband, Dayo, my mentor and pillar of strength, I've, he always knows, he has always understood that, understood me and encouraged me, and being also a father figure to me. Thank you, Dayo. <laughs> to my son, Tochi. Tochi, thank you. My sunshine. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your understanding while I burn the midnight candle. And you say your mama is with her computer. Thank you, Tochi. I, I appreciate you. To my siblings, many of them are here. <laughs> Ada, Chima, Egodi, Ezenwa, Obianuju, the twins, Nemeka and Kelechi. Thank you. Ada, thank you for being the true firstborn, for your love, for your care, for everything. God bless you. And to my extended family, Ada's husband, Uncle John Wori, my auntie, Asinugo, my uncle, God's will, Ihe too. Is he? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Uncle. Thank you, Auntie Olive. Thank you, Engineer Sinugo. Thank you. Thank you. The Adiola family. Some of you came all the way from everywhere. I don't want to name where you're coming from. Thank you. But I truly appreciate your sacrifice of love to my father-in-law, the King Emmanuel Adiola, to my uncle, Uncle BJ, Dayo's uncle, uh, Uncle Bade Alabi. Is my uncle Bade here? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas, for always encouraging me to read and be on my, stay on, uh, glued to my computer. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you so much for taking care of us. Thank you, Bola Yinka, BC Kunle. And thank you, BC, uh, thank you, Bola, um, BC's wife. Thank you, they're all here. Thank you, the entire family. I truly appreciate you. I want to thank the VC. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, truly appreciate you. I want to thank Professor Weche. 
I want to thank Professor Yinka David West. I also want to thank Inchen Nauzo. I want to thank Kings. I want to thank Kingsley. Thank you, Kingsley, for having registered. I want to thank our former Vice Chancellor, Professor Juan Eligato. I want to thank Professor Alos. Thank you so much. Thank you for providing an enabling environment for me. Thank you for the support I have. I appreciate. I also want to thank my friends here. There are so many, too many to be mentioned. Thank you for supporting me. I am so overwhelmed. Thank you, Cornerstone Insurance. Thank you, Simi, that came, and the children from Stoge Orphanage. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Bell. Thank you, Pastor Jude. You all know. Thank you to my banking colleagues, my friends from Citibank that are here. I appreciate you. Okay, these are also, I named all LBS. Thank you. <laughs> I will go through. <laughs> so I'll just say, <laughs> Thank you, Benedicta. Thank you, everybody. I th thank you. I want to also thank, I mentioned my banking colleague. I want to also thank my clients, um, my everybody, the people online. I want to say thank you. You've all provided a support for me, support that I cannot even begin to express my appreciation. And to all of you that have been with me in this journey, and to those that have upheld my hands, to those that have encouraged me, my mentors, too, that I had listed also in the book, thank you. I just want to say, may the good Lord bless you all. Thank you, everybody. Amen. Thank you. And lastly, I don't want to forget, I want to thank Professor Olusoji George. I want to thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Akinkube. Thank you. Thank you, Nat Boso. Thank you, Ife Dabo Adeleye. Thank you, all of you, that when I first started, you held my hands. I am grateful. Thank you. And again, I say thank you. For everybody, I say thank you, thank you. There are so many of them. Adebukola, Jane Kalari, thank you. I've listed so many people. I listed Obi and Ebi, AGK, you all know yourselves. I am so, so grateful. I am so, so grateful. I was just listening and listening, but time will not permit me. Thank you, Titi Wenjora, you're here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mazi. Thank you, Cheokokwa. Thank you, Mrs. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Bameke. Thank you, Obinwa. Thank you, Moses. Thank you, Kachi. Thank you, Valentine Ozibo. Everybody, the list is so much. And to my church, Victoria Fellowship Church, thank you. You're all here. I appreciate you. I truly appreciate you. I truly appreciate you. My sisters from Federal Were, please can you stand up? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Pro Unitate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And to Abba, you have been with me for 10 years. Abba. I, Abba. God bless you. Thank you. So for everybody that has attended, I say thank you for being part of my journey. And <laughs> thank you, God bless you. You know, with the amount of thanks uh, Professor Adiola has made, I'm afraid to say thank you once more. <laughs>
Okay, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Professor Enasi Okonedo, we want to thank everyone for attending the 15th inaugural lecture of Pan Atlantic University. So we return the thanks to Professor Adiola for giving us a great lecture. <laughs> We also extend our appreciation to the Adeola family, their friends, who by their presence have made this day special for Professor Adeola and the entire university community. A special word of thanks goes to our staff members and partners who have planned and executed this event. Once again to everyone, we say thank you for coming and may God grant you a safe journey back to your various destinations. So a quick announcement, we will soon end with the rendition of the anthems. But once that is over, the academic procession will leave the auditorium in the reverse order. All are to remain standing until the academic procession exits the auditorium. Once that happens, we will have cocktails served in the foyer outside the auditorium. Please rise for the anthems. <laughs> 